welcome to Late Night with Monica Price, where this week I'm joined by singer-songwriter Michael Armstrong, whose new single, Matters of Heart, is out now, and a new album coming out this summer. Michael has been a constant hit in the music industry, touring with some of the biggest names in the business, including Leo Sayer, Tapao, and Beverly Craven, and working with some of our great musical legends. We talk about his life, his love of music, and how a visit to California inspired his latest album titled Oh Hi. Come and join me on Late Night with Monica Price. Hi, Michael. It's so good to meet you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Hi, Monica. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. Now you're really welcome. And Michael, what a what a fantastic career you've had so far. I mean, you started very, very young, but we're gonna we're gonna be talking all about that. And you've got a new single which is out now, Matters of Heart, which yep. I've heard and it's fantastic. So, but it's it's really been building up, hasn't it, your career as a singer-songwriter? Yeah, it's been uh, I'm not a young man, as you notice, but uh, I'm not too old, I, <laughs> I guess. I wouldn't say, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I wouldn't say anything. <laughs> I've, I've loved music since I was, I don't know, since I first heard it, I guess seven or eight years old. I've, I've I fell in love with music and it's always been a huge part of my life. And um, I was drawn towards playing an instrument, I think, looking back on it, because I wanted to express myself through song. Yes. Um, because as soon as I could play an instrument, as soon as I could play a few chords on the guitar, I was I was writing songs. Uh, not very good ones. I hope I've got better. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, and, um, yeah, I just, and I love words as well. So I, I'm, lyrics are important to me. So, yeah, I mean, I, I played in various bands. I, I, I tried really hard, like you do when you're when you're a teenager. Yes, that's right. And uh, then um, my, my my father said to me, um, "While you're doing this kind of music lark, you better come and work in work in the family building business." Um, they were they were very supportive, my parents, but clearly sitting at home writing songs was not earning me any money. So uh, they wanted me to me to get off my backside, basically. So I went to work with my dad, and. Um, sort of 15 years later, I was still there, you know, um, yeah. real life had taken over. I had children, got married, had a mortgage and, and uh, suddenly this, uh, you know, I was doing something which, which I, which I felt I wasn't born to do, if you like. Yes. And I had to make a very difficult decision um, and take a gamble really to, to, to go for, to go for the music and a whole series of, event, of events helped inform that decision. Um, one of the things I met a lady called Lisa Davies, who I know you know, who's been in the music business a long, long time, and um, she really liked my songs. Um, my dad got ill; he'd had a heart attack, and I'd been working with him, um, and so he didn't really want to carry on, and I didn't want to carry on by myself. But obviously, I had three children, a mortgage, and a wife, and mm-hmm. I had to discuss it with them. And so I took I took the gamble, and here I am, some ten years later releasing my third album and having played lots of wonderful shows and spoken to lots of and met lots of absolutely fantastic yeah. people so I guess it paid off yeah I mean you have I mean you've been on kind of every talk show radio show you know you've met some great people you met Paul McCartney what was it like meeting Paul McCartney oh that was incredibly emotional because McCartney was he was my hero you know when I said I was seven or eight years old I was listening to the Beatles my mum had seen the Beatles in 64 I think when she was a teenager yeah. And so she loved the Beatles and, and they had the, the blue and red albums, the greatest hits. Oh, yes, albums, greatest hits. Cassette, yeah. They had them on cassette in their car. And so I was always singing along to them. And I think when I was 11, for my birthday, my mum and dad bought me the complete Beatles album collection, vinyl in a box set, um, which is a strange thing for an 11 year old to ask for. But yes. and I listened to every album in order and studied the artwork. And so. To find myself, I don't know, 25 years later, meeting Paul McCartney, probably the most famous man in the world. I mean, I'm, and I'm including kings and queens and presidents in that. Yes, yes. To meet him and to find him so down to earth, so giving, um, so kind, so humble, so brilliant. And he was know. very complimentary about your music, wasn't he? He oh, was, but he yeah, made me rock star. I, I gave yeah. him a CD and he was like, hey, rock star, man. Hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
meeting come about? Was it just, was it, was it planned? Was it a chance meeting? How did it come about? Oh, no. I mean, well, it was a chance meeting that I kind of engineered. Yeah. Um, we, I, I was working with Lisa and we were representing Cliff Richard. And it was at Buckingham Palace at the Queen's Jubilee concert in 2012, yes. was it? Or 13 of them. Um, and Cliff was obviously performing like he does at all these events. And so we had weekend passes and we were there for the sound checks. And I think Cliff had done his sound check on the Saturday. And then I'd seen on the list that uh, McCartney was sound checking on Sunday morning. Yeah. So even though I didn't need to really need to be there till five in the afternoon, I was there at about half seven in the morning yes. hanging out. <laughs> And, um, and so I got to I got to watch him sound check with about five other people, and, she, and he played for about forty five minutes all the Beatles classic, all loads of stuff that he, all the stuff that he didn't play in the evening actually. Yes. And uh, I just hung around afterwards, and he came over to me. He'd obviously spotted me singing along at uh, the top of my voice, probably drowning him out to be honest. And he came over and said, "Oh, hi, I'm Paul." I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and, uh, yeah. and uh, I, I cried actually when when he I shook his hand I had my photograph done we had a chat and he got in his car I said he had to go off for tea and uh, I just I cried my eyes out it was one of the most emotional things I've ever ever experienced. What a lovely memory though because you know from there you've as I say you you've written this your third album um, you know you're continuing to write the Matters of Heart is a single that's out now it's doing really well and you know and it's very very. Uh, emotional actually because it's about your parents isn't it so what was it because you've been on this journey musically yourself Michael that you felt you wanted to include your parents almost I think so yeah I mean I've, I've got wonderful parents best mum and dad in the world I'm sure lots of people say that but um you know they've been huge as I said they were hugely supportive of my of my music career I mean when I was 12, 13, 14, they would buy me a guitar at one birthday and Christmas, I'd get a, four, a recording machine, you know, so, and my dad was into it as much as I was. So I got all these gadgets and I was, so I was recording and producing music from a very young age. And, and they're also, you know, they're, they're, they're children of the, children of the sixties, but they're also kind of, I guess they're the, the baby boomer period, you know, born yes. in that aftermath of the second world war. And they're both really intelligent and extremely hardworking and have built an incredible life. I know I had a wonderful childhood, mm -hmm. my brother and I, and they've had a really successful life. They're That's in their like 70s now. And I think there's something about that generation, that uh, um, those people who come in, in the baby boomer period, I think they've got so much, so much grit and determination and daring and tenacity. Yes. And, and I, I think probably because they had nothing to lose. I mean, they literally had nothing to lose. They came from very, they came from very much a working class background, my parents. Yeah. And um, I think that do or dare attitude, my dad instilled into me, which is why I took the gamble when I did. That's it. Um, and I mean, you, and you've you know, played, you know, in so many places around the world, you supported. Who was the best person um, that you've actually worked with or supported, Michael? Who's somebody that you really thought, wow, this is great? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, I've I, I played with lots of people. I mean, actually on tours, I've done tours with uh, Leo Sayer, which was yeah. that was the first major one I did. And that was that was special in, in its in its own right, because, you know, I was I was actually so, I was solo, solo warm up act, if you like, or guest yeah. artist. Yes. And I was playing the piano and guitar and, and I would I think on the second night I was in somewhere in Manchester and I walked out in front of 1500 people and you could hear a pin drop. And, um, you know, to get that sort of recognition and that applause and then come off at half time and have a have a queue around your merchandise table and people yeah. saying lovely things to you and signing things. You know, it's it's what you dream of as a, as, as a kid. So that was yeah. fantastic. And uh, I worked with Tapao. That was another great tour because I think Tapao were the, were the first band I ever saw when I was great 14. Band. Very my good mom band. And dad, yeah, my mum and dad took me. I had a real crush on Carol Decker. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so... So I actually got a phone call from Carol again. Talk about things coming full circle. This was 30 years later, or whatever. I get a call from Carol Decker yeah. uh, asking if I could work, if she wanted to work with us. And I ended up going on the tour. And not only was I the support act, but I also became part of the band to Pal. I played percussion 
and did backing singing. So I ended up being on stage for like two and a half hours, first of all, doing my set and then playing with, with, with the band. So that was a wonderful experience. I really enjoyed that. Because you are a multi-instrumentalist, aren't you? You know, you, 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 play, you play, you do lots of different things. So, you know, it, it's, is that something that you enjoy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I had guitar lessons when I was young and that's the only thing I've ever had lessons on. I taught myself to play the piano during rugby lessons at school because I wasn't a fan of rugby and they let me stay in the music room. Um, I started out as a drummer, actually, originally. So I, I was a very good drummer. And um, I play a little bit of saxophone, keyboards, bass. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a virtuoso at any instrument. I only ever wanted to to learn enough to accompany my voice, really, because yes. I wanted I wanted to write songs and express myself that way. So, yeah, but I, I, I'll have a bash at anything. Maybe not the bagpipes. Yeah. <laughs> And as far as like your shows were concerned, you had shows lined up, Michael, for, for last year and obviously coming into this year. What, what's, what's the situation with your shows? We did a big show in 2019 in London, which was meant to be the uh, Kickstarter. This was for the last album, Looking for yes. the World. It was going to be a Kickstarter to a tour in 2020. We obviously all know what happened there. And I'm hoping to go out and tour this album in 2022 i haven't set anything up for this year because i am skeptical still as to whether yes. we you know wh whether so anything can, isn't it? so difficult. anything can, anything could still happen and i i know everyone's desperate to get out but i worry also that people will be audiences will be worried about getting into what are to be honest pretty sweaty little venues you know I'm, I, you know it's not the yes. only two where i'm gonna go yes. away there Proper yeah. rock and roll venues. Yeah. And so I, I worry about the crowds yes. going there. So we're looking at 2022 at the moment. Yeah, well, that's good because you get lots of time to plan, you know, and people will be desperate to go out and listen to music. So, you know, that's really great. Have you been collaborating with anyone, Michael, at all during the lockdown? Or what have you been What have you been up to during the lockdown? Have you been writing or what's been happening? Well, I, mean, I finished this album, first of all, during, yeah. during the lockdown. Um, there's one song on that on the album called Each Other's Eyes, which is a collaboration with an American guy called Sam String Stringfield. Yes. Um, but other than that, I've, on my previous album, I worked with a producer called Warren Bennett. And Warren and I have actually been writing all throughout lockdown and still continuing to. We've written over 40 songs, right. which are intended for other artists. We've got a project for a female singer and another project for a band. So, um, yeah, we've been I've been doing lots and lots of writing, keeping really, really busy. It's, it's been a really it's been a really fruitful and, uh, and time. time almost, isn't it? And what's the name of your new album, um, Michael? Is it the is it the title track Matters of Heart or is it? No, it's not. Track? The album is called Oh Hi. Oh, yes. That's right. o, o J A I. That's and right. I, I remember reading yeah. that. You, you that comes from your you actually went there. So it's a, a Californian small town, isn't it? On the West Coast. That's correct. Yeah, it's about an hour and a half. Yeah. About an hour and a half drive, two hours drive north of LA up the Pacific yeah. Coast Highway, Wonderful. and I was yeah I was invited there in 2018 to spend some time with uh, US singer songwriter Ben Folds, who happens to be one of my all time heroes and influences. And so me and a bunch of others, uh, we were there writing songs yeah. for about a week. And a lot of those songs that I, that I wrote appear on the album. So I thought Oh Hi has got to be a great name for it. Yeah. Yeah, it looks cool yeah. as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I've seen the cover. I just, uh, forgive me, I just couldn't remember the, the title of the yeah. album. But it's great. It's great. Now, when is that album due to be released? The album is actually released on the 25th of June, okay. 2021, this year. But as you say, it's actually available for pre-order now on all the usual platforms. And yes. if you pre-order it, you immediately get the single Matters of Heart. And is this sort of an album that you're very proud of? Is it because it's it's slightly different flavour to it than you know I've listened to some of it and it's slightly different flavour to some of your other stuff you've been doing. Was that intentional? Did you just want to go another way, or just happy with happy with how your creativity took you, so to speak? Um, I guess nothing. I wasn't really intentional. I didn't say I'm going to do something different, but there are some key different elements to the album. Firstly. Mm -hmm. It was mainly written on the west coast of California, so you can't help but be influenced by, yes, by the sun, the sea. <laughs> well, yeah, and the history, because yes. you know when you think of Laurel Canyon and you know the, the Wonderland, that you know the, all those great Crosby, Stills and Nash and Jackson Brown and Dylan and all those, all the great Joni Mitchell, all the great music that came out of there. I think that's 
that can't help but you know i drove from la up the pacific coast highway past malibu beach i was writing while i was driving you know it was that it was such a fantastic experience Wonderful. and the other elements are i produced the album i put myself the last two albums i've co-produced with someone else um so this was completely my own choice of songs my own way of production and this is the first time I've used I've, there's some there's some of the familiar musicians on it, but I've used a guy on guitar called Antoine Saltz, who is a French guitarist who I met about two years ago. And he's a songwriter and a, and a fantastic player himself. Yeah. And I just asked if he'd join if he played the album and he just he just understood straight away. I'd send him a song and he'd come back with his guitar parts and say, what do you think of this? And I'd say, that's fine. Don't do anything else. That's brilliant. <laughs> you know, so I, I think all those elements make it a bit different. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And, and then presumably once you've, well, obviously that album's coming out, are you writing another album? Are you penning another album as you speak? Yeah, the, the, I am planning another album. Um, but it, that, this is a, the next album is going to again be very different. But you have to wait and see for that one. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> nothing you can tell me about now. Not just yet. No, oh, we we'll <laughs> have, we'll have to come back. Yeah, you'll have to come back on and uh, and, and tell me about it. But Love the, mu the music industry, you know, it's forever evolving, ever changing, Michael, isn't it? And how have you seen it change and evolve? You know, just in the space of time that you've been working in it. Oh, that's a difficult question um i mean it's no doubt that the, the biggest difference for a songwriter is um the streaming and the download situation um it's very difficult now to make any money as a as a songwriter mm -hmm. i mean if you take take for example you know i don't know i, I think i think uh, the last last statement or something on a, on, a, on a song I did at Christmas had something like forty two thousand listens, which is yes. incredible. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, and you get about and you get about sixty two pound for that. I know. <laughs> um, um, Very if you think, isn't it? Well, if you think when I was a kid, um, if I wanted to listen to a record, I had to go down to Woolworths, which is yes. my local shop, and yeah. buy it on vinyl, and then that became yeah. cassette or CD, and I probably spent ten pound on that. So if 42,000, if 42,000 people went and bought it, you're talking about an awful lot of money. Yes, you'd yeah? be a very so big fan. So <laughs> yeah. So um, I think you've got to do it for the love of it. And and um, and, uh, and also radio has become a lot more of a closed shop. Um, you know, it's very, the, the DJs these days, unfortunately, certainly on national radio, don't get to choose what songs they want to play. No. It's the committee that choose a playlist and you have to play those chosen songs. So, and that loses, that loses character. The DJs, you know, you used to get yeah. some fabulous characters. And I think, unfortunately, that's a bygone era now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, things progress and we have to move yeah. with it. And, 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 and what, what we do have now is we have social media. Yes. So there is the opportunity to reach a lot more people and to communicate with people yes. a lot more, you know? Yeah, and I mean, like we're doing today, you know, if it wasn't for the, you know, the way that the world is at the moment with social media, you know, we would normally be in a studio, but obviously that's changed at the moment. So we're able to do this. So it, there's always some pluses, isn't there? Always some absolutely, pluses. Absolutely, yeah. yeah is absolutely. there anyone that you'd like to tour with, Michael? <laughs> oh goodness absolutely bob dylan oh bob's my hero another yeah. one of my heroes. i mean just about anyway i'd love to talk with bob dylan cool so with mccartney we've already spoken about yeah um ben folds of course who, who i was in ohio with yes. in fact i even asked him when i was there next time we did a uk tour to make sure i was his support act Quite right. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean the list goes on i mean i'm i'm more of a fan as you can tell of the kind of 70s uh yeah heritage artists if you like um i i still think that music lives forever billy joel's another one you know it's just yeah. these guys these guys just you know so they put a, put a tour off, they sell out instantly yeah. yeah that's right well it is it's a timeless process sometimes that sort of music isn't it it just it goes from year to year and it, it never it, it always seems to be current Absolutely, yeah. I mean, they're they're still played on the radio, and I say they still those that still tour sell out in seconds, you know. So there's an audience for it, and that's what it's all about. No, that's it. My, my kids listen to it as well, you know. I was going to say, yeah. Do, do your children do you listen to your music? Um, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> as, 
actually they do. Yeah, I mean, my, know this. My, my middle son is he'll be eighteen in a couple of weeks, yeah. and he, he's he's he, he's not ashamed. He's he's a bit out there, you know, yeah. and uh, he'll certainly plug it and and talk about it. Yeah. And my oldest son, who's twenty one this year, I think he was a little bit. Ash- not ashamed but embarrassed by it like you, know, you should be of your parents yes absolutely but, yeah. but as he's becoming a little bit older now I think he's now becoming proud and, and I actually listen to it and would tell his friends that look what my yes. dad does yeah, and the little right. guy the, the little guy who's 14 he just he wouldn't say anything to anyone it would be the most embarrassing thing ever <laughs> to think of dad see so it should be it's like, is it funny is it as, and as they grow older then they'll be they'll really appreciate you then but the, that, that sort of teenage years now they don't want anything to do with you michael definitely nothing no. nothing to do with you whatsoever <laughs> less but it's it's been it has been a difficult time you know it, i've discussed this with musicians i've had on the show you know it's been a difficult time but you know the things the things that are going to change will be that we will we are coming out of this and the venues are going to be opening again and what, what's one of your favorite venues michael have you got a favorite um, I mean, <laughs> favorite venue to go and to go and to, to actually go and see a band. Yes. And the established bands need to uh, need to play the bigger venues. Yes. Um, I like I love the London Palladium. I saw yes. Bob Dylan there a couple of years yeah. ago, and it's not a place that Bob Dylan would normally play. It's normally the O2 or something. Yes. Yeah. So he was outstanding there. Um, what about for you to play at? Where would you like to play at? Oh, well, I'd love to play the Royal Albert Hall just because it's the Royal that's Albert Hall. Yeah, that's right. There's yeah. no doubt about that. But, uh, you know, I, I love I love places like Brixton Academy and Shepherd's Bush Empire. Yeah. You know, they've got great sound systems, the, you know, Hammersmith Apollo or whatever it's called now. It changes its name every year, yes. doesn't it? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so all, you know, all those great all those great places. And the Hollywood Bowl, maybe. Yes, all that. Wouldn't that be lovely? And, yeah, and Wembley. Got- Oh, Wembley. Wembley. Oh, we've got to have Wembley. And and when you're working, um, Michael, do you have lots of people around you? Have you got like a support team? You know, people that you obviously Ben, you've spoken about Ben Folds. But is there other people that you work with? You know, as far as production's concerned, do you work with the same team, or do you tend to just, you know, see how things pan out? It tend, well, as I said, this time I've actually produced the album myself, and that yes. was part because we were in lockdown and so yeah. we couldn't communicate. Although, yeah. obviously, as we said, with, yeah. with, the, with, the, with technology, we're able yeah. to to do that now. But I wanted to do this. I wanted to do this one by myself because I thought I felt I'd learned enough from my previous collaborations to give it a go myself, and, I, and I'm proud of the result. But I, I do turn to some of the same musicians. Ed Barker plays saxophone on the album, and um, I would always go to him first. I think he's an incredible player. And if he's available, he'll do it for me. And uh, John Howells plays the drums. And Simon Lockyer is the string arranger, because I love lush strings. And yes. he, he arranges the strings and, and records them for me and has done on all three albums. And so, yeah, there's certainly some go-to people, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And have you got a favourite track on this album? What's your hmm. favourite one? There's... Oh, I love the single Matters of Heart. Mm. There's a song called Fandy Cappuccino, mm. which is a very odd name. And, and uh, I, there's something about that song which, which I really like. It's completely mad. Um, in fact, <laughs> the, um, they observed, when I first joined Facebook, however, yeah. like 10 years ago, whenever it was, someone made friends with me from Indonesia called Fandy Cappuccino. <laughs> and I thought, what a fantastic name. I'm going to write a song about so, that. Yeah. <laughs> and I did. Um, this, um, but the song has nothing to do with the poor guy. You've probably right. never heard. Of it. I'll, <laughs> never, I'll have to send it to him. You know, yes, I was going to say you need to send it to him. Definitely, I need, I need to send it to him. He'll be thrilled. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's kind of a, it's the story of a of a gangster getting caught, mm. or you think he gets caught, and in the end he escapes to Indonesia, which yeah. is of course where Fandy came from. Yeah, which is yeah. completely bonkers, but it's got a kind of Steely Dan feel to it. And some great saxophone by Ed. So that, that's one of my favourites, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, we're going to play some of your videos um, after the interview today, Michael, so people can get a flavour of what you know your work is. And it, it looks like the future. You're going to continue to do what you're going to do. And then, of course, once we open all our lovely venues, you're going to start preparing your shows, I'm assuming. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, my favourite place to be is in the studio, writing and recording. So I'll always continue to do that. Yeah. But we're all going to be itching to get out and perform yes. and, and not just perform, but to go and see other people perform, to yes. go and see live music again, you know, and have a beer. 
I can't yes. wait. <laughs> <laughs> those were the days. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Eh? Yeah, do you remember those? Yeah. Well, well, it's been great to speak to you today, uh, Michael. Thank you so much for taking time to come and join me tonight. Um, you know, and we look forward to seeing what your album does and and how well it well, how well it's received. I'm sure it will be received very well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for tonight, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Come back and join me next week. And I look forward to seeing you then. Take care for now. Bye bye.